Don't f with rodeo clowns. That's what I take out of this. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mindy Silva. Welcome to the Wiki Tree Challenge, where in one week, our team of volunteers will work together to uncover as much as possible about the family history of a notable person. Are you ready for this? I am, I am. <laughs> Paul, your week was led by team captain Cheryl Hess. Karen Lowe earned the most bounty points and Kathy Ravenstein was the MVP of the week. And of course we had Mindy, our challenge coordinator and host. WikiTree researchers from all over the world worked around the clock scouring records, newspapers, wills, and much more to find stories, photos, and 280 new relatives for you. Here's a little glimpse of what that collaboration looked like. The amazing thing is, is that you guys have still come up with a ton of discoveries. Because sometimes we just get second wins. We're like, I'm going to go to bed. Good night, guys. And then <laughs> you find the one thing and you're, you're like, oh, wait, this tab was still open. Uh, I, I have to finish this. So, you know, it might continue like two hours in the morning. You go to bed at like three o'clock. That's one of the times when the collaboration is really key, you know, because there were so many people that touched that family. What I right. really like is the research notes though, because um, today I found someone else, same name, same city of birth, same birth date, sort of birth year, but I found his death certificate and it wasn't the guy I was working on because he had a oh, different wow. father. So I put a research note in the one I'm working on and said, this is not the guy. That's what I'm trying to do is, is since I have his address, I can focus on his address, but I still need to make sure that we collect all these other Williams. Recommendation might be for some of these lines just to keep pushing back. I probably would really tell him to consider taking a DNA test. I'm new to this. This is my first, like, uh, collaboration like this. this is very cool thank you for all your hard work and i really do appreciate everything you found this week in your branches we found a lot of tragedy and young deaths with the occasional humor and, and longevity mixed in now we did try and pick from some of the more positive stories we found but those of course weren't as plentiful as the sadder, item, sadder items were well it all makes sense now <laughs> Now, Anne Galley the first, is the first ancestor I want to introduce you to, and she's your second great-grandmother. And for her line, we're reaching out to your second great-grandparents on the male Gilmartin line. It goes from you to your father, to your grandfather, William, to your great-grandfather, Thomas, and then to his parents, Patrick Gilmartin and Anne Galley. And she was, an, she was an interesting character and did not get along with some of her neighbors once she was a widow. And then after that, there are numerous complaints filed between her and <laughs> mostly two other families uh, for cattle, a mule, four pigs, and 12 geese trespassing on the other's property. Oh so my this was, God. yeah, this was a bit amusing. Anne appeared to have issues. One of the neighbors she had issues with was John Malby. Now she was a defendant in a Kalala case on the 9th of May, 1867. And John Malby was the complainant. The issue was a trespass of her cattle on their land. Two years later, a case was heard for Anne Gilmartin, who accused John Malby of letting his cattle trespass on her land. The case was dismissed for no appearance. She appeared again in the court records in 1872 when she made a complaint that the cattle of Pat Donahue damaged her oats and potatoes. And here she's getting more specific. The oats and the potatoes were damaged. The witness was Daniel Gilmartin, so I'm assuming her son. And the case for the trespassing cattle was adjourned to the West Court. In August of that same year, she made complaint that Thomas Bork's mule and 12 of his geese did trespass on her property. At the same time, Pat was complaining that her four pigs trespassed on his line. So I guess we can get from this that nobody had fences. <laughs> and, and they just weren't okay with everybody's animals crossing the line. Not sure oh how they were supposed God. to know where that line was, but um, Anne was assessed a penalty for, uh, for the pigs trespassing. If you look at that last entry, you can notice the names uh, for the May 9th record. And that was a Catherine Galley that made complaint against Anne Galley Gilmartin. 
So I'm not sure of the exact relationship, but it appears it was a lively one. Catherine was the informant on the death record for a Martin Galley, who was the most likely Ant's brother. Ant lived her days out there in that small town. And the final trespassing case was heard in 1873, less than two years before she died. She died in 1875 at the age of 68. She had survived her husband, Patrick, by 18 years. Her sons, Daniel and Charles, remained in Kalala as well, both working as farmers. Her middle son, Thomas, however, migrated to the United States at the age of 18, settling in Pennsylvania. He worked as a laborer at the coal mine and later a watchman at a department store. We'll go for a fun ancestor. This one took us across the path of James J. Jerry McCormick, starting on your father's side going to his father, William Gilmartin, then to Mary McCormick, his mother, and she's your great grandmother. Mm -hmm. And then finally over to her brother, Jerry. Now, Jerry was the son of William McCormick and Bridget McFadden. He played professional baseball, debuting with the Baltimore Orioles on the 1st of May, 1883. No way. Positionally, he played third base, first base, and left field during his career. He had a 262 batting average and it wasn't a long career, you know, but he was a third baseman in major league baseball for the Orioles uh, of the American association. And also the following year for the Philadelphia Keystones and the Washington nationals of the Un union association. And then here's what the stadium looked like in 1883 when he was with the Baltimore Orioles. Wow. Another story you didn't know, huh? <laughs> no kidding. Okay, my my dad would have loved to have known that because he was a baseball nut. Uh, so it's it's too bad that information never never got down to him. Now we're going to go to your second great grandfather. Another one. This is Hugh O'Donnell, and he was another Irish immigrant. And he was on your father's side of the tree. So we go to his mother, Rebecca O'Donnell Gilmartin, then to your great grandfather, Joseph Ignatius Stanislaw O'Donnell. That's quite a mouthful. Yeah. And finally, reach your second great grandfather, Hugh Joseph O'Donnell, and his wife, Rebecca O'Neill. Now, Hugh was born in 1831 in Ireland per his death record. And then Hugh and Rebecca migrated to Pennsylvania in 1866, settling in Philadelphia. Now, Hugh was a laborer when the 1880 census was taken. And at that time, they had added 11 children to the family. It was noted that Hugh could not read or write. His wife, Hannah, took care of the home and family. Their daughters, Hannah, Annie, and Rose were all bread makers. Their sons, Arthur and Joseph, attended school. So it was really only Gracie that stayed home with Hannah during the day. And although the 1880 census didn't collect this data, only six of their children were living when it was taken. So here was another one, you know, where they'd had a lot of loss. And it was the 1900 and 1910 census records that showed us she had birthed 11 children in total. Good Lord. I know. And, you know, either way, losing this many would be just so tragic. And your direct ancestor, by the way, was number 10. So if you look, they lost John was seven, Kate was eight, Grace was nine. And you had a sturdy one. Joseph made it. So. Wow. But despite the hardship faced by this couple, their hard work and dedication paid off. Now, Hugh was employed as a watchman by the railroad. By 1900, he owned their home free and clear. He'd become a naturalized citizen of the United States and his children went on to become nurses and other professionals. So, you know, Hugh and Rebecca really did experience what people call the American dream. This one, we're gonna go along a little bit of a different branch from your father to his mother, Rebecca. Mm -hmm to her mother, Mary, and finally, to her parents, Alexander McCoy and Julia Kennedy McCoy. Now, per the 1900 census, 
Alexander emigrated in 1862 and became a naturalized citizen. His wife, Julia, emigrated in 1863. Now, both were born during the potato famine, so their families must have been experiencing financial difficulty. Alexander and Julia had 16 children over 27 years. 16 Good Lord. Good I know. Lord. <laughs> God bless that woman. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, yeah, only eight of the children reached adulthood. Now, many of them died as babies from scarlet fever, diphtheria, or other conditions, you know, which now we vaccinate against yeah. or we can cure. But back then, those were a big deal. Ooh. And uh, undernourishment, too. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, they were a close-knit family, but likely not well off financially. You know, and I say that because you'll see that it, when you look through the records for this family, they they stuck together. They really did. You know, they didn't, kids didn't go, oh, I'm 18 and move off. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them um, stayed within the home there and, and helped out. But some of their children actually work at a fairly young age instead of attending school. So in 1880, their 14-year-old daughter, Annie, worked at a shoe factory and her 13-year-old brother, John, worked at a cotton mill. Alexander, he was a cooper by trade, so he made barrels. He lived to 59, Julia to 67. So once again, the, the mom outlived the, the dad. She was a widow in 1910. She had children and a grandchild in the home with her still. So there were seven other adults in the house. Her children and their spouses all held jobs. Julia was home for her granddaughter, Winifred, while they worked. She had led what looked like a difficult yet fulfilling life. And it's apparent that her children carried on the sense of family and hard work that they had gotten from their parents. Well, that you ended with me. <laughs> that ended with you, huh? Because you, right. you weren't carrying on the big family trait or... <laughs> Or the work ethic. <laughs> oh, or the work ethic. Well, now you work. I do. I do. So next, we're going to go ahead and take a look at your maternal great-grandfather, Frank E. Fisher. And this one starts on your mother's side. Goes to her father, Alfred Fisher. To his father, Frank Fisher. And then we get to Frank's Zavi Fisher, who is actually born Francois Zavi Le Boissonnier to Francois Zavi Le Boissonnier and Henriette Francoeur in 1868. The family lived in Port Fairfield and Grand Island, Maine, and in St. Leonard, New Brunswick, among other places. And I noticed you did have a number of the ancestors in Grand Isle, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where my grandmother was, uh, was raised. She did actually spoke uh, French until she was about six, and then she learned English. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a really nice way to do it. Yeah. Now he married twice, first in 1892 in Fort Fairfield, Maine to Marie Helen Nelly Poitras. They were the parents of four children, including premature twins who died within a day, Pearl Agnes and Alfred Joseph. But what we did find interesting was that he was a dealer in horses, carriages, and sleighs in Fort Fairfield and in Grand Isle. Slaves, for, did you say, or sleighs? Sleighs, sorry. Okay, big difference. <laughs> Yeah. We're not dealing. Yeah. We're, we're not dealing with yeah, enslaved the, people, no. <laughs> right, right. He also owned a hotel in Grand Island, and this was really fun. It was called the Frank E. Fisher Boarding House and Restaurant. He owned it from 1908 to 1912, and there's a picture actually taken um, around that time period. This is one of the photographs featured on MainMemory.net. Now, it was taken in 1905 when Frank would have been a carriage dealer there. You know, I don't know about you, but I just love seeing the clothing of the era mm -hmm. and, you know, the horses and carriages on the unpaved main street, all the stuff Gosh. that was the norm back then. Yeah. Such a trip. Here you can see that Frank was also a deputy sheriff for some time in Grand Isle. Now, he seemed to have been kind of a jack of all trades and very involved in the community. For this connection, we went to your grandfather, Fred, and then over to his sister, Pearl Fisher. Mm -hmm. Her husband was Arthur Busca, and his father was Philip Busca, and this is who the story's about. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Can you see why we had to share this one? 
we found a lot of information about Philip. Oh so my it says, God. Yeah. <laughs> So it says that Philip Busca, he was 75 years old at the time. Uh, he'd been residing in Great Falls, Montana for about 35 years. And he was living in just a small shack. You know, he made a modest living on the outskirts of town. He was raising his chicken to make a living. And so on the day in question, Busca had been in town to sell some of his chickens, for which he received $22. That was probably quite a bit back then. Yeah. Unbeknownst to Philip, his chicken wealth did not go unnoticed in Great Falls. In town that day, there were two shady characters, or two shady clowns to be more precise. Both men worked as rodeo clowns when they worked. Ray Blackie Brooks was an ex-convict whose re criminal record included arrests in Washington State and Nevada for intoxication, robbery, and assault. Paul Miller was a native of Bozeman, Montana and had been arrested previously for intoxication and assault. They were both intoxicated that night. According to a written confession later made by Miller, he and Brooks had been drunk that day and continued to drink in town until 8 p.m. At that point, the two clowns hatched their dastardly plan. They would go to the home of Busca and steal his chickens. Things did not go according to plan. The two men severely assaulted Busca, though Miller claimed not to remember the assault because of his drunkenness. The men stole two of Busca's newly earned $22, they took his watch, and they took Busca's shotgun. As Miller explained, they were afraid that Busca would shoot them with it if they didn't steal the gun. They did not get away with any chickens. Don't f with rodeo clowns. That's what I take out of this. Yeah. <laughs> so Brooks was sentenced to 40 years imprisonment with no chance of parole. And Miller, who, it, you know, they determined was a bystander to a lot of the attack, was sentenced to five years imprisonment. And Philip, Philip himself lived on for another 14 years, dying at the age of 90 in Great Falls. Wow, what a trip. I know, right? Starting on your mother's side again, we go to Aline Morneau, your grandmother, her mother, and then to Aline's father, Charles Jean Morneau, mm -hmm. and finally to Charles, his father, and your great-grandfather. This is another one of the remaining buildings in Grand Isle. They preserved that and they preserved several homes from the original community. But the house we're gonna look at is the Morneau House. This one was built back in 1857. The Morneau House is believed to have been built in 1857 by Charles Morneau, your second great grandfather and a French Canadian immigrant. He settled in the Grand Isle main area in 1856 and the next year married Flavie Thibodeau, your second great-grandmother. Charles was a merchant trader and provided space for a post office in his home when members of his family served as postmaster. In 1973, the house was donated to Our Living Heritage by Norman Bupre and her husband, Addie. She is Charles's great-granddaughter and your second cousin. In 1975, the house was moved to the Acadian village where it still stands to this day. So if you ever want somewhere to visit. <laughs> yeah, that's on my bucket list of, of places to, to go to. I've never been to Maine. Ooh, see, now that would be great. You could go yeah. walk in the house. I act like a big shot. Uh, excuse me, I know what I'm doing. Uh, I belong is, here. <laughs> I belong here. Back up. <laughs> I want to talk to you about another second great grandfather, Alexis Sear. And here we travel on your mother's line again to her mother, Elaine, to Elaine's mother, Suzanne, and finally to Suzanne's father, which is your second great grandfather, Alexis Sear. Now, Alexis was born on the 7th of December, 1836, in St. Basile, Madawaska, New Brunswick, the son of Paul Sear and I'm not sure how you say that, Salome Thibodeau. He was first listed in a census record in 1850. At that time, his family was living on the Van Buren Plantation in New Brunswick. His father, Paul, was working as a farmer and owned $4,000 of real estate. Three of his brothers worked as laborers. Eight of, the, of his nine siblings, including the three worked at, that worked, attended school. So here we see that his father was born in Maine and his mother was born in New Brunswick. 
His sister Eleanor died the following year at the age 11. Three years later, his brother Remy died, age 27. And Alexis and Philomene had four children between them, one son and three daughters. Nine months after Christine was born, Philomene died. And so here's, you know, Alexis with these four children. Now, several years before his death, Alexis represented his district in the state legislature. He was later said to be one of the principal citizens of Aroostook. He died in 1887 and he was buried there. And, you know, once again, you just had so many interesting people in Grand Isle. It was just so fun to go you through know, there. Crazy. I, I can't believe the amount of research that uh, you guys did. It's so in depth. Not many people know that Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, faced a lifelong battle with depression. You and President Lincoln are connected through marriage. Your third cousin, Joseph Cormier, married Abraham's second cousin, Melanie Hanks. Jim Carrey, a fellow comedian, has also struggled with depression throughout his life. You two are related by blood. Jim is your seventh cousin once removed. Your common ancestor is a woman named Genevieve Serro, who was born in Quebec in 1667. All told, you have 29,408,000, it's actually 483, 984 cousins now through blood or marriage on Wikitree, with almost 900,000 of those being living Wikitreeers. Wow. That's a lot of presents for Christmas. <laughs> I love genealogy presents. They're yeah. so much fun. <laughs> And then I do want to say a special thanks to all the people who made your challenge week so successful. So every one of our researchers, uh, you know, whether you did a lot, whether you did a little, it just is incredible when you put it all together. Yeah, and then of I, course, I, I want to thank them as well. So what do you think of all the cool new stories that you it, got? It's amazing seeing the documents and the pictures and it going back a couple of generations further than than I was aware of was just uh, really, really cool. Really cool. It's, uh, I can't imagine how much work went into that. Wow. Yeah, thank you so much, Mindy.